Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, uh, take your Bibles or your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 39. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 39. Now, as you're turning there, happy Father's Day. Guys, uh, for dads in here, I can tell you right now, uh, I lost my father four years ago, and still to this day, his legacy impacts my life and how I raise my own son. So fathers, thank you. Thank you for what you do and for the influence that you are in our children's lives. Um, Now, as you're turning, uh, let me start out this message with a question. Um, How many of you in this room, and I want you to raise your hands really high, maybe stand if you feel the need to, but how many of you in this room, uh, you're just proud of your humility? You're so humble. Why is no one raising their hand? (laughs) Isn't that a kind of a weird question? I am humble, I kind of think so, but to raise my hand would be against my humility, so should I raise it? If I do raise it, does that mean I'm not humble? It's a weird thing, isn't it? Humility. Um, Luckily for you this morning, um, you are very fortunate because I'm one of the most humble people in this city, and I'm proud of it. So I'm naturally the person that should be delivering this message I'm joking, people. It's a joke. Um, Any person who's humble would never say anything like that. Um, Although I do have a couple of books coming out uh, that you might want to read up on um, if a publisher will pick them up. The first one is Humility, How I Achieved It and How You Can Achieve It by Being Just Like Me. Um, The second one is The Ten Most Humble People in the World and How I Made Them That Way. Um, That's a joke also. Come on. Um, We have been doing a series on spiritual battles, and today's discussion is on the battle with pride. Um, And and so we're going to be talking about that this morning and what the Bible has to say about pride. Um, But I think pride is probably exemplified the best in sports parents. Have you ever gone to a child's like baseball or soccer game or football game, and you've seen the parents? Uh, They're worse than the kids, right? Right? Uh, in most cases. Now, I've done some internet research. I trolled the internet to kind of figure out how to categorize different sports parents, and I've got a list for you. There's, there's five, four different types of sports parents, so let me give you two of them real quick. Uh, the first one is the cheerleader parent. Uh, now, this is the kind of parent that we all hope to be, the one that cheers their kid and cheers the team and cheers the other kids on. That's the kind of parent that we all want to be, but let's be honest, none of us are actually like that. Um, we're more like the next three. The next one is the instructor parent. Uh, the instructor parent is the one that is screaming at their kid, play by play, blow by blow, what their kid should be doing. They're yelling more than the coaches are yelling. They're giving more instruction than the coaches are giving. Um, Now, I will confess to you right now, I have a tendency to lean towards the instructor parent. That's me. Uh, I have many, many soccer games and baseball games been yelling, Knox, get the ball, and then had to go, oh, I got to stop that. That's awful. Um, So that's the the second type. The third type of parent is the blamer parent. Uh, This is the one whose kid's perfect in every shape, way, and form. Uh, They're the parent who... If their kid doesn't make a play, it's everybody's fault except their kid, right? Um, And some of you are blamer parents. I'm sorry. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, They're the ones that yell at the refs or the umps all the time. Uh, That's how you recognize them. The last one is the insulter parent. This is the parent that you want to punch in the face with a metal folding chair. (laughs) These are the parents that are hurtful, the parents that you're like, man, just go home. You're not helping, you're making things worse, you're making all of us feel bad, stop it. So, but we've all caught ourselves being one of these parents. Maybe not all of them, but we've all have a tendency, or we see somebody at a game that is that parent, and you go, oh, that's awful. But isn't that our pride welling up? Uh, We have so much pride in our kid or our children that that pride takes over and almost makes us a horrible person. Uh, because of that pride. And and so we want to avoid, you know, we see that kind of parent uh, at the games and we go, ooh, that's awful. I don't want to be like that person. Um, But it's hard not to sometimes because let me tell you right now, pride makes us blind. And here's what the Bible actually describes it as is 
you're a blind person leading the blind. And I'm here to tell you this morning, don't be a blind person leading the blind. Don't be that person. Don't be that parent. Don't be that guy or girl. Um, So look with me, Luke chapter 6, verse 39, where I told you to turn. Luke chapter 6, verse 39. It says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Here's the difficulty with pride. Pride is the most devious sin that's out there because if you're prideful, you don't know it. Most other sins, if you're a greedy person, yeah, you may have a little bit of a conviction of, oh man, I gotta, I'm greedy. Or, or if you're um, kind of lustful or whatever, maybe you, you're aware of that. But pride blinds us. It blinds us to the fact that we're being overconsumed with ourselves. Because let's face it, we want to be proud of ourselves. We want to be good people. But the fact is, is sometimes we're not, and most of the time we don't even realize it. Now let me clarify what I mean by pride. Because in the English language, pride actually describes many different things. Uh, But the biblical word usually only describes one very specific form. And, And so... In the English language, pride can mean you're proud of someone or you're proud of yourself or you've got a sinful pride built up in you. But when we talk biblically, the biblical definition of pride is a self-consuming, self-absorbing selfishness. It's basically when you put yourself above others. You're here and you view everyone else down here. That's the biblical definition of pride. There is nothing wrong, it is not unbiblical, it is not a sin for you to be proud of your child. That's a good thing. You know, it's good for me to look at my son and go, Knox, I'm proud of you, buddy, you did really good. That's good for me to do that. And it's not a bad thing, it's not a sin for somebody to walk up to you and go, man, you did amazing with this, you knocked it out of the park. It is not a sin for you to go, thank you. I worked really hard on that. Uh, That's not a sin. But when you start viewing yourself here and everyone else down here, that's when you're starting to step into sin. So that's what we're talking about with pride. And that's why it's so blinding. That's why it's so deceptive. Is because most of the time we don't realize that we're placing ourselves up here. And so we're usually not aware of it, but so how do you know that you're prideful? How do you know that you're struggling with this area of pride? Well, let me give you a few things. Uh, So listen to these and ask yourself, do I do that? Is that a characteristic of my life? The first one, are you quick to judge others? In other words, are you, do a lot of your conversations sound like, well, that person, blah, 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 blah. Is that a characteristic of yours? Because that's pride. That's you putting yourself up here and putting everyone else down here. The next characteristic is, are you superficial or attention sinking? Uh, And this can mean anything from uh, wanting to be in the limelight. Hello. Uh, I like being on stage. I like being, having the lights on me. So this is a struggle of mine. This is an area that I have to fight constantly. Um, But, Do you have a tendency to try and keep up with the Joneses? Because doing that is actually a symptom of having unchecked pride in your life. Because what are you trying to do? You're trying to elevate or fit in status-wise with someone that you deem, that you view above you, when in reality, you should be paying attention to those around you and helping out rather than trying to elevate yourself. The next one, and this one may be a little hard, is... Are you always right? Is your opinion the only one that matters? Now, don't look at your spouse. It's Father's Day. We don't want to start Father's Day off wrong. But do you have a tendency to just think that you're always right? Do you think that everyone else is wrong, that everyone else is stupid, that you're the brilliant one and everyone below you is an idiot? Because if you do, that's a symptom of pride. And guys, let me be very honest. Your opinion is not the only right opinion. There are lots of right opinions. There are more ways to solve problems than just one. 
And so your opinion may even lean towards the right end of something, but it doesn't mean it's the only right opinion. Your opinion is important. You should value it. But when you insult others or put others down because they don't agree with you, you're prideful. So the next one is do you get defensive easily? When someone confronts you or calls you out, do you get defensive quickly? Or do you go, you know what, maybe they're right. Maybe I need to make a change. And lastly, do you show favoritism? In other words, do you have a tendency to uh, favor those that you want to be like or that those that can give you something or get you something or increase your status? Because the danger with that is that you're ignoring those that are around you who are in need, that may need you, that may need some of your time or may need some of your resources because you're paying attention to these that you want to be like instead. So if you're guilty of any of these, maybe you're struggling with pride and don't realize it. But here's the hard part. How do we keep from being blind to our pride? If pride naturally blinds us, then how do we overcome or how do we cure that blindness? Well, luckily for us, the rest of the passage that we're in gives us a step-by-step on how to cure blindness to pride. And the first step to this is realize that you are a student. Step one to curing your blindness to your pride is realize that you are a student. Look at verse 40. Luke 6, verse 40. Jesus says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. So, You want to be a student who is striving to be like his teacher. That's the point. When you submit and realize that you've got a teacher who is above you, who is smarter, who is wiser, who is more experienced, then your pride takes a back seat. So you've got to realize that you're a student. And whether you're the boss or uh, whether you're the low man on the totem pole, we are all students under God. Realize that every single one of us in this room are needing to realize that God is our teacher and we are his student. And that's difficult sometimes. It's difficult for us to do that. So how do we have an attitude of a student? How do we take on that role of a student? Well, here's your answer. We have to have an attitude of submission. We have to have an attitude of of submission. And this is difficult because basically what you're saying when you submit to God is because you are all knowing, because you are all wise, because you are eternal, you were ex- in existence before time began and you will exist long after time has ended, because you are all present, unchanging, you are perfectly holy and righteous, I will submit to what you tell me. And the idea here is that we're gonna, we have all gone to things in the Bible, read something or heard something from a preacher or a teacher, and we've heard that biblical teaching and went, wait, I don't know that I agree with that. But the fact is, is the one who is giving us that lesson, that teaching, is infinitely smarter, wiser, knowledgeable of everything than we are. And so we need to submit to God's teaching, whether we agree or understand it or not, because he's the one who's eternal. He knows the past, he knows the present, and he knows the future because he's living and active in all of it. And so he knows better than our tiny little minds could ever understand, no matter what the cultural opinion is, because he has the experience and knowledge that we don't. Basically, he's the genius level and we're the morons and we just need to do what he says. I hate to say it that way, but that's the fact of it. Our minds are nothing compared to the mind and knowledge of God. Our wisdom is foolishness compared to the wisdom of God because we're not God. And something I want you to notice here is God doesn't say that if we're a student, we'll eventually become the teacher. It says that we will become like the teacher. In other words, by submitting We're striving to be like God. And that's the whole point. We're trying to be like Him. Our life, our words, the things we do, all of that should reflect God Himself. 
So, you want to overcome pride, the first step is to become a student. Then, once you've become a student, the next step is to strive to be a log remover, not a spec inspector. Strive to be a log remover, not a spec inspector. Look with me in verse 41. Luke 6, verse 41, it's, and Jesus is still talking. He says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take out the log from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. How many of you have ever gotten a piece of sand or a speck in your eye? One of the most annoying things on the face of the planet, right? You get something in your eye, it itches, it bothers you, you can't sleep, you can't watch TV, you can't eat. Well, maybe that's a little extreme, but it, it's, a, it's so annoying. And I've got a great wife, and she comes to me, and she helps me, and gives me eye drops, and she walks me through my frustration and helps me with that. But if I went to my wife and said, oh, I've got this speck in my eye, it's really bothering me, it itches, oh, it's driving me crazy. And my wife walks up and says, well, let me help you with that. And I look up and she's got a log sticking out of her eye. Am I going to trust her to help me? No. And Jesus uses this very extreme illustration purposefully. He's trying to illustrate to us that from a spiritual sense, that's exactly what we do. We need to be in constant self-evaluation before we're going to go and try and help someone else. It doesn't say don't help and don't confront and don't help others in their sin and struggles. It says that we need to remove the log out of our own eye before we can do that. So what is, that's great, but what, how do we do that? What do we do here? Well, the first thing in order to be able to remove the log is we have to have awareness. We have to have awareness. This is going to be a shocker to many of you, but none of us in this room, including myself, is perfect. <gasps> That's right. We are not perfect. Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single person who has ever lived in the existence of the world, except for Jesus Christ himself, is imperfect. We're sinners. We've messed up. We are messing up. We're going to mess up. And we have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm not perfect, and now I'm aware of that. But it's not enough to just be aware once we're aware, we then have to go and live a life of confession. Live a life of confession. Christ calls us in James chapter 5 to once we are aware of our sin, to then go and tell someone, to confess it, to ask for help, to ask somebody to give us strength to not continue in that sin or struggle or temptation anymore. And I'll be very clear I'm blessed. I'm truly blessed in this area because I'm surrounded by a staff team here at Calvary that I could go to any member of our staff at any time and go to them privately and say, listen, I'm struggling here. Pastor Chad, I, I, I str I'm struggling. This temptation is in my life. I need your help. And any staff member on this team would surround me and help me get through that struggle or that temptation. They would hold me accountable. Here's my question to you. Do you have somebody like that in your life? Do you have someone in your life that you could go to and say, I'm struggling here. I'm being tempted here. Please help me. Because if you don't, go find someone. Go find someone that you can confess that to and find strength in. Because we need to be surrounded by followers who, as we confess, will lift us up and walk with us and help us be strong in Christ. And if you need help with that, eh, come talk to one of us. We would be glad to walk with you through that. So once you've become a student, and then you've become a log remover instead of a spec inspector, the last step is to be delicious, not destructive. Be delicious, not destructive. Some of you are going, ha, ha, ha. let's read. Verse 43. 
And Jesus said, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of, the e- out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Now, there's an infamous uh, youth ministry game where you basically, you lay a table out, uh, and on the table you place five to ten uh, caramel-covered apples. And you get volunteers, one for each apple, and you say, hey, uh, here's the game. Uh, when I say go, you're going to grab your apple, you're going to eat it as fast as you can. The first person to down this entire apple wins. And all the kids get excited because who doesn't want to eat a caramel apple first off? But what they don't know is that one of these caramel apples is actually a caramel-covered onion. Oh, it's a great game. It's awesome. But here's my question to you. Does your life to the people who are around you, your friends, your family, coworkers, etc., is your life like a caramel apple? Or is your life like a raw onion? And let me be very honest. If you like eating raw onions, you need help. That's sick, people. Um, But is your life like a delicious caramel apple? Or is it destructive like an onion? Because let me be honest with you. Pride is always destructive. It will destroy your relationships. It will destroy blessings. It will destroy finances and life. Pride always destroys. And so is your life delicious or is it destructive? Well, how do you know? How do you know whether that's a problem, whether, you, whether your life is delicious or destructive? Well, I've got some questions for you to answer. The first one is, does drama seem to follow you around? In other words, Is your life full of drama and every relationship you have full of drama? Because you may be the reason for the drama. Sorry. Not sorry. Do you always seem to be in trouble? Whether financially or with the law or with friends and family. Do you always seem to be in trouble with those around you? Because again, you may be the common factor there. And it may be pride that's causing that. Uh, Next question, do you have a difficult time maintaining friendships, relationships? Do you have a lot of severed relationships because you destroyed them somehow, or you had a a part to play in destroying them? Because again, that's pride playing out in your life. Because what does this passage say? It says that the treasures of your heart produces the fruit. But it also produces the words And so here's two more questions. Do you have a tendency to hurt with your words? How do you use your words, both publicly and privately? Here's the last one. How do you talk about people publicly and behind the closed doors of your house? When you get home and the door shuts behind you and it's just you and your spouse or you and your roommate or you and your friends, do you start bashing people? Do you start talking bad about people? Do you start verbally assaulting people behind those closed doors? Because if you do, that's a symptom of pride. And that's not a delicious life. That's a destructive one. But no matter what you answer to these questions, we are all going to struggle with pride at some point. Whether you're winning that battle right now, there's going to come a point where you're going to start losing that battle, where you're going to start struggling in that battle. And so, How do you know that you're constantly producing good fruit? How can you ensure that you are producing good fruit and you are delicious, your life is delicious to the people around you? I have an answer to that. Live a life of humility. Humility. Humility is the key to being delicious, for your life to be delicious to those around you. And I kind of started out with talking about humility because if you look at pride and you look at humility, they are polar opposites of one another. 
If there is humility in your life, pride cannot coexist with it. The two cannot exist together in one life. And so if you can live a life of humility, then pride will go away. So we have to live humbly. We have to live a life of humility. But what is humility? Because I gave you a little bit of a description at the beginning, but let's look at what the Bible says about it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, gives us a definition of humility. And it says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, catch this, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Humility is simply this. It's putting God and others before yourself. If you were sitting in a row of chairs, humility would you be you taking the third chair rather than the first or second. God first, others second, then you. That's the definition of humility. It's saying, Lord, I'm going to submit to your teachings. I'm going to be your student. And then I'm also going to sacrifice my time and my resources to look out and take care of those around me so that I can be a delicious tasting fruit to the lives of the people that I have influence with. So here's my challenge to you today. This is a hard subject. You know, every one of us struggles with pride. I struggle with pride constantly, and it's something that I have a couple of people that keep me in check on this very topic. But here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to do some serious self-analysis. I want you to evaluate your life and the fruit of your life, and I want you to start drumming up what are those areas in your life that you fall short on. What are those areas that you don't quite meet the standard? And then once you've recognized some of those things, I want you to find someone in your life. And guys, this is a big one. I want you to do this this week. I want you to find someone in your life, whether it's a friend or a spouse or one of the pastors here at Calvary or uh, just someone that you look up to spiritually that you can trust. I want you to find somebody that you can go to and say, hey, I'm struggling in this area. This is a sin that I'm having a hard time with. Will you help me? Because we are called to confession, but we're also called to have people walk alongside of us. So find somebody this week. And then lastly, in order to prevent yourself from being here and placing others down here, I want you to shift the roles around. And I want you to look around in your life at the people that you live with and live around and work with. And I want you to identify at least one person that you could sacrifice some time or resources to help this week. In other words, I want you to put someone before yourself. I want you to intentionally this week sacrifice some of your time to go talk to somebody that needs someone to just talk to. Or maybe someone needs some groceries and you've got the resources to go help them out. I want you this week, every single one of us in this room, to go find someone that they can put in the seat before them, that they can help. Because if every single person in in this room found one person and went and sat and talked to them when they needed someone to talk to, or they went and bought some groceries, or they helped out, what would change here in Lake Havasu? How would the life of Lake Havasu look? It would be changed, because people would be ministering to people. So that's your challenge this week. Go out Look in the mirror spiritually. Find an accountability partner. Find someone you can confess to. And lastly, find someone that you can go and put before yourself. Join me in prayer.